It seems to work, yes. Yes. Let me introduce uh, Christopher, of our team, and meet Explain today flexible models. Thank you, Gwenda. And the pointer is pointing, good, as it should. So yes, I already said uh, good morning to everyone, so I'm just saying that again, good morning to everyone. Um, since this is the last talk of the morning, and then there is the lunch, and there is still the afternoon going on, I thought I would do something really light as a presentation. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, yeah, what are, what are good flexible models, uh, especially for complex data, and uh, yes, where you can find them. And I don't know if anybody in the audience uh, saw the, yeah, the movie reference that I, that I tried to make with this title. When I said it to my team, they, they didn't see it, so I was already disappointed. It is the, the sequel of the Harry Potter movies, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. That's what I tried to, tried to mimic with this, but obviously it did not work out. Okay, so my plan for today is uh, at first a little bit of a motivation and then some, some history about modeling. Before I will say what, at least in my opinion and what I found in literature, are good properties that a flexible model should possess, we'll give very short examples and then in the end indeed indicate you where to find them. So, the basic idea of modeling data, well, in many situations, you wish to have a probability distribution that actually matches well your data and allows you to describe your data. Of course, we have seen uh, yesterday also very nice non-parametric methods, so this is an alternative. to Non-parametric methods, indeed, are very good if you want to make general inferential statements. That's the way that you should, that you should go for, and um, optimal transport is really... Uh, brilliant way of addressing these questions. This is when you are in applied statistics and you have concrete problems where it is of interest to have a formula that actually describes the data at hand. And from this formula you want to then um, deduce certain characteristics about your data. And it also reflects a little bit our human desire to, to, describe the, to describe the outside world. And very often we like to have a mathematical formula. Think about when the COVID started, we were thinking, oh, what? That this increased, is it an exponential increase? Immediately these ideas came to mind. So somehow we feel reassured if we can find a formula, not too complicated formula, that allows us to describe the data. So where did the history of this uh, start? Well, it did not, there were already some basics of probability before, but I would like to start it here with Carl Friedrich Gauss. So, Carl Friedrich Gauss, I think all of, all of you know him, of course, uh, he was not only a mathematician, he was also an astronomist. And so, what he did is, he was observing the stars. And he knew that his measurement instrument for the, to indicate the position of the stars, he knew that there were mistakes in these measurements. And so, he knew that there was a, his final measurement uh, would be what, he, what is the true measurement plus some error. So what he sees in the end is not the exact emplacement of the stars, but there is a certain error about it. And, well, he had the brilliant idea that it would be very better, much better for him if he had a formula to describe this error. Because with this, uh, with this formula for the errors, he could then make the calculations and even quantify the uncertainty behind his, um, behind his measurements. And so, this is, by, com by taking various considerations, this is how he came up with the famous uh, Gaussian bell curve, which therefore was also known in the beginning as the law of errors, because it was known from astronomy, ah, that is the formula with which you describe the, the errors. So that was the first name. And it stayed in the domain of astronomy. And how did it get out of astronomy? Well, there, that was a Belgian influence. The famous Belgian scientific Adolphe Quetelet, he is very famous. Let's see how famous he is. Who knew the name before? Small, a small minority. So, but he, he is very well known in Belgium. And um, 
So he was a big fan of the Gaussian distribution. And he had seen, oh, it's nice that there is this distribution to describe the errors in measurements that you do in astronomy. And he then had the idea, let's go one step further. Why, why do we just say that it is the errors in the measurements in astronomy? Could it not be that all measurements that we are doing, also in biology, in sociology, in other fields, actually, that all these measurements are a general mean plus some error? So, for instance, his idea was all human beings should have the same size. The fact that they are not the same size is a law, is an error by the nature. And he wanted to describe this error by the nature by the Gaussian distribution, which is why still nowadays we use the Gaussian distribution to describe the distribution of heights of people. And um, this, this is what brought the Gaussian distribution really to the, to the, to the large public and to other fields. So, now it was known as the Gaussian distribution. And a little star was born, indeed. The Gaussian distribution in the 19th century was used in so many different areas, and it got used to model nearly everything. And this is why, around 1880, there was such a strong belief that everything could be described by the Gaussian distribution, that somebody coined the term, let's just call it the normal distribution, because it seems to describe the normal state of things. So, the normal distribution was the star around that time in modeling. But then, around 1819, something happened that uh, would actually change the fate of modeling and statistics until today. And what came was the influence of the crabs. Might, might seem unexpected, so what happened with the crabs? Well, around 1819, there was a zoologist, Walter Weldon, who was with his wife, doing holidays at the Bay of Naples. And uh, what, they did, what he did when he, was, uh, when he was there doing the holidays with his wife, well, he wanted to work. So what he did was, he, he was gathering crabs that he, see, that he was seeing there um, close to the, to the sea, and from each crab he was taking 26 different measurements. And he gathered no less than 700 crabs. So he was quite busy, poor his wife. And um, what he did with, this, with these crabs was, well, he rushed home and then he was looking, oh, hey, each characteristic, well, I know, of course, they have to follow a Gaussian distribution. So he was, he was plotting them, oh, nice, nice, nice. And then all of a sudden, uh, he, was, he was very surprised and he's, there was one of the 26 measurements where the histogram was not at all normally distributed. He was shocked at that time. So what he did is he sent this data set to a very famous statistician of the time, Pearson, and um, this is when Pearson started to have the idea, oh, maybe not everything in the world follows the normal distribution. And so people started to, uh, to come up with more and more ideas for alternative distributions to the normal. And actually, Carl Pearson, he was a very strong, uh, he was a very strong person in that sense, because he even uh, had an entire lab whose goal it was to work on data and see which model was the best fitting model for that data. He founded the journal Biometrica, which is nowadays a very famous journal, and in the very beginning, the early days of Biometrica, the contents were modeling probability distributions to data. And since he was quite strong-minded, when somebody came with distributions that were not of the so-called Pearson family, that was badly seen. So they had trouble to get published in Biometrica. Let's put things as they are. But, um, yeah, also other people, of course, came up with alternative proposals, among which Fernando de Helguero came up with this uh, very famous skew-normal distribution, which is usually attributed to Adelchi Azzalini, because he re-described it in 1985, and it is associated to his name, but originally it was de Helguero in 1908 who came up with this, uh, with this proposal. And, um, well, let me give you a modern-day example of data that are definitely not following a normal distribution. Here we have heavy tail data from finance. So, on the left, what you can see here on the left, these are 200 financial returns data from the Standard & Poor's 500 and the Nasdaq indices. So, what do we see? Well, here is the center, zero, zero. And we definitely see that it's not symmetric around zero, right? There is a clear asymmetry towards this region here. Now, what I did here is I fitted a normal distribution to this data. 
And then with this best fitting normal distribution, I simulated 2,000 data points. And this is what you can see here on the right. And we clearly see a different pattern. This is the best fitting normal distribution. And yet, well, of course it is symmetric because it's a normal distribution. So already this shape is not working well. But also you can see here that the lowest points, so the most negative uh, results, they are bounded to minus three. While here we had, we had something below minus four and even once uh, around minus six. So clearly the normal distribution is way too optimistic uh, towards financial returns data. And this was one of the reasons also uh, why banks were making underestimations and it was one of the reasons that also has, has led to the financial uh, crisis because they were not using the right, uh, the right data. Further reasons for modeling with probability distribution. So the first one, I already said it in the data analysis. Well, it's nice to, to, have, to have a good fitting distribution because then you can describe the location, can describe the scale, but also other aspects such as asymmetry or kurtosis. Calculation of relevant quantities. Yes, you want to be able to determine uh, a formula for the risk of exceeding a certain threshold for certain correlation measures. You might want to describe survival functions, the peak, when we're talking about the epidemics, we want to describe the peak of an epidemic. But also uh, the banks, for instance, they use fan charts, which are based on some kind of skew normal distribution. Enrichment of other statistical techniques. Well, I, re I just refer here to the, to the nice presentation of Florian, who was showing you that there we can use probability distributions to enrich learning. And then, of course, also the field of stochastic modeling. Uh, when we have situations like the spread of disease, or if we want to, um, to make predictions about rainfall, development of ec ecological systems, and many other domains, it is just not possible by ourselves to make calculations, to calculate the risk, to calculate probabilities, because this is so complex, this is so complicated. And what we need here is, we need stochastic modeling. So we need to be able to generate data that actually allow us to retrace, oh, this is the data as we generate it and we see then what is happening sequentially. And that is very important. And in, um, in the situation of, of COVID-19, we have often seen these predictions, which were actually based on, uh, on stochastic simulations. So that also is where we need probability distributions from which we can simulate. So now, the properties that a good flexible model should, uh, should possess. Let me first state a very famous aphorism all models are wrong, but some models are useful. The late George Box uh, is usually being attributed uh, to, have, to have said this sentence. And um, let's, now, let's now see what, uh, what flexible distributions are and what they need to possess to hopefully, at least, be a little bit of use. And so um, even though we know that they might be wrong for the not completely correct for the data set, that they can be useful as uh, says this statement. So which properties do we want for a good flexible model? Well, as the name suggests, it should be flexible or let me use this alternative word, uh, versatile. So it should be able to, with this one formula, we want to be able to model various different uh, shapes. It should also be tractable. Of course, you, you, we know that the more parameters we add, the more flexible our, this, our, our curve can become, but then in the end we will end up with a super complex expression where, in, where we don't really understand what is going on and where it just becomes mathematically untractable. That's also not what we ideally want. Interpretability is very important. We want the parameters of the model to be clearly interpret, interpretable, to have roles that you can understand, because only then can you really describe the problem at hand. Straightforward parameter estimation I think this is an obvious one. If we have a model of which we cannot estimate the parameters, well then, yeah, we will not be able to fit it well to the data. Data generating mechanism, well, this refers to what I said before. Um, we want to be able to generate data from our distribution to, in order to simulate the data. And um, so that's the part that I, that I said uh, for, from before, if we, if we want to make stochastic modeling, but also if we have a nice stochastic representation, so a probabilistic formula for 
this distribution, this might actually allow us to trace back the real data generating mechanism. Huh? If we know that, okay, this, uh, a random variable following this flexible distribution is obtained as a sum of these two other random variables, well then, and if we know that in the nature, this and this random variable, they both appear, well then we can see, okay, their sum, we add them together, this can give rise to these data. So we understand the data generating process. And last, um, I call this testability and model reduction. If we have a nice flexible model, it will all often contain interesting sub-models. Well, you have seen in Shogo's uh, presentation that uh, the model contains um, interesting sub-models, be it in the marginals or in the conditionals. And um, testability refers to the fact of being able to make, uh, to make tests for a sub-model within the bigger model, because then you can even make goodness of fit tests for these sub-models. And for more details, uh, this is uh, something that I, that I wrote uh, down in this paper with my former uh, PhD student, Sladjana Babic, and with Domin Kranz. Let me give you now a few examples of complex, of complex data. So first, I, re I remind you the, uh, the case of elliptical symmetry that, that Mark has, has told about yesterday. So uh, a random k vector is said to be elliptically symmetric around some location theta and with a scatter matrix describing the shape sigma, if and only if its density is written under, uh, it, the density is written under this form here, where f is the so-called radial function. So we see it's quite, quite conveniently written down, and we also here have a nice stochastic representation, which goes under this form here. So all we need is a k-dimensional uniform random vector u, uh, and we need a non-negative random variable r. And then, by this simple formula, we can generate a random quantity that is elliptically symmetric. And when I say elliptically symmetric, I think of shapes like these such as when you make a cut at any level, we see that the contour that we obtain actually follows an ellipse. So you see, even if you make the cut a little bit higher, you have this elliptical symmetry. And examples of elliptical distributions are the multivariate normal, student t, power exponential, there are really many. So elliptical symmetry is, is very good as, it's, as it it uh, generalizes the normal distribution and is also the basis of many uh, inferential tools. However, it also does have its limitations, and it is here where we see if you really have complex data with um, asymmetry, multivariate asymmetry, then elliptical symmetry is insufficient because it is unable to capture skewness. Well, since it is symmetric all the time, it is unable to do so. And also, if the tail weight is uh, different, very different according to the directions in which you go, then Elliptically symmetric distributions might also be not your best choice because it is, in general, they have a one-dimensional parameter that governs the tail behavior. So if you think of the multivariate student t distribution, it has just a one-dimensional parameter for the tail weight, which thus has to be the same in all the different directions. So that's a cl clear limit of elliptical uh, distributions. When you know that your data are symmetric, this is a good flexible model. But if you have suspicion that there is asymmetry and varying tail weight, then elliptical symmetry is not the best model. Uh, instead, what you might wish to go for, which is more flexible, are co copula-based multivariate distributions. So we have seen already today uh, the explanation of what a copula is, so I really don't have to say much. It is whenever we have the distribution function that can be written under this form, we have a copula C, which is a multivariate distribution function with uniform marginals, and we have the marginal distribution functions here. So it allows, it allows us to model um, separately the marginal distributions and the dependent structure. So we already see that this, by construction, gives us a lot of freedom and a lot of flexibility. And what, I'm, what I want to mention here are the so-called meta-elliptical cop uh, copulas. These are copulas based actually on these are distributions, sorry, that are based on elliptical copulas. So we take the elliptical distributions that we have seen before, which are symmetric, and we take them as copulas. So the copula, the dependent structure, is, enjoys this symmetric flexibility, but in order to introduce asymmetry, well, you can, you can then play on the marginals. And one nice example of this is if you combine, for instance, the t copula with the 
shine, arc shine marginals of Jones and Pusey 2009. I show you here briefly the density. Uh, this is a very flexible one-dimensional model that can, can be asymmetric as well as symmetric and also has a parameter to govern the tail weight. So with this you can really reach many different shapes and that is what I'm showing you here. So on the left hand side this is what the type of shapes that you can get if you want it to be symmetric. We see that, uh, well, there is some form of symmetry, but it's way more general than elliptical symmetry. And if you also want to add the asymmetry parameter in the different dimensions, well, then these are the types of shapes that you get. So it's really very flexible, this combination. And yet it remains quite tractable. And for the financial da returns data that we have seen in the beginning, this model actually gives quite a nice fit. Now I also, of course, since we, since we have many experts here in directional statistics, I also show an example of circular data. So here you see one such example. It is the directions of waves presented as a Rose diagram. So we see here that we have the case of um, a bimodal data set. And what is so difficult with circular data is you can represent this, of course, as data on the interval 0 to pi. But since it's a circle, the density at the value 0 has to coincide with density at the value 2 pi. And for circular data, I just want to give you one example of a distribution that I think is a very good flexible distribution. And this is the Cato-Jones uh, model, so proposed by, by Shogo together with Arthur, uh, not with Arthur, with Chris Jones in 2015. So the density is very simple. Right? It is of this form here. There is nothing complicated uh, in this density, also no complicated normalizing constant. The only difficulty, if you want, is this, uh, this condition that needs to be satisfied. It is a, a general distribution which includes uh, some well-known uh, special case, again, the rept cauchy distribution, but also the cardioid distribution. It is very tractable, as I said. Uh, the formula is really simple. When gamma is positive, when the parameter gamma is positive, then we know that this distribution is always unimodal. So when we have unimodal data, we can be sure if we use this distribution and we enforce gamma to be positive, well, then we have a nice, flexible, unimodal distribution. It can be both symmetric and asymmetric, as well as flat, topped, or sharply peaked. We have all the different um, shapes that are possible. The parameters are very, very clear roles. So mu is the mean direction, gamma is the so-called mean resultant length. Well, it's a shape parameter, basically. And then um, the other two parameters, so rho and lambda, they are directly related to the concepts of circular skewness and circular kurtosis. So we can even relate them directly to asymmetry and, um, and tail weight. Random variable generation was also quite easy because you, it follows directly via a simple acceptance rejection algorithm based on the rept Cauchy variables. And the rept Cauchy variables, they are easy to, to, to generate. And parameter estimation is also possible both via method of moments or via uh, maximal likelihood. So this is a very good unimodal um, distribution. And if you have a data set like this one here, well then, what I would suggest is take a mixture of these unimodal distributions and you will get a very nice uh, fitting of shapes like this one. And if you're interested in mixtures, tomorrow Zhang Schiltz is going to talk about uh, mixture models. So finally, let me conclude by saying where to find them. Because it's not so easy, there is a jungle of different distributions and more and more and more distributions are actually being proposed in the literature. Which is why it is good to have uh, review papers like this one so I'm just showing you, uh, this, is, this is a uh, review paper done by Al-Malki and Nadaraja. They, it's just about modifications of the viable distribution. And you don't believe how many different viable extensions have been proposed in the literature. Notice the policy that I have chosen here in my, in my, um, here in my listing. I chose a very small, uh, very small policy because the list is long. So there is until 2014, and believe me, since then, many more have appeared. There is the inverse viable distribution. Well, that's still quite well known. Then you have the log viable distribution. You have the compound viable distributions. You have the reflected viable distribution. The gamma viable distribution. The Keys and Fanis modified viable distribution. The exponentiated viable distribution. The generalized viable distribution. The additive viable distribution. 
the extended viable distribution. Let's, uh, the, the word gen generalized is already used, so let's take modified viable distribution. The generalized power viable distribution. The modified viable extension, uh, attention, 11 is modified viable distribution. This is the modified viable extension. It's different. We have the beta viable distributions. We have the odd viable distribution, flexible viable extension, the generalized modified viable extension. So here we combine the generalized and the modified into the generalized modified viable distribution. We have Sachan and Zandin's modified viable distribution, Kumaraswamy viable distribution, Kumaraswamy modified viable distribution, and Almaki and Yuan's modified viable distribution. It is becoming very hard to follow up on all this, which is why. Um, General overview papers like this one are actually very useful, but also it's, um, I think sometimes it's, it's perhaps better to not just propose one more extension just for the sake of proposing extensions, because in the end you, you, get, more, you get lost in all this. Um, so in order to not get lost, well, there is this, um, if you're interested in the viable, then I definitely recommend this paper, which is, which is a nice paper uh, to get an overview. and. Um, General references, I indicate those here. There is a, a very nice paper by Chris, by Chris Jones where he makes, uh, in the International Statistical Review, where he makes a property-based comparison of flexible models on R. With my PhD students, Ladana and um, David Veredas, we have tried to mimic this in the multivariate case, so to also make a property and simulation-based comparison of flexible distributions. Then, well, yesterday we have seen uh, the talk by, by Masanobu where he, they have proposed a new vision on circular models that comes from time series, where you also get a very general construction and can get many, many distributions. Uh, well, this is the paper that I uh, already referred to where we made a critical review of flexible distributions, not only on RK, but also on the circle, the torus, and the cylinder. And then um, with Kanti Mardia, I made uh, also a review paper, but I refer you more strongly to this very nice review paper by Arthur Pusey and Eduardo, uh, who made a review of directional statistics in general, but in this is also contained a review of flexible models on the circle, the sphere, the torus, and the cylinder. And um, I will also end up, and so I had a little bit of similar thoughts as uh, Tomoyuki, I'm also referring to this uh, Brussels Waseda workshop in 2008. So this is a screenshot of my talk that I made at that moment. That was actually my very first presentation that I made as a, as a PhD student. And as you could see from the, from the pictures, I was much younger by then. Uh, so I was talking about general multivariate skewing mechanisms. And it's, uh, so for me, it's really a particular pleasure because to have you here now, because it is really there that uh, in a, in a sense, my, my scientific career, in terms of talks at least, started. So thank you for that, and uh, thank you very much for your attention.